Hi everybody and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology 1. This is chapter 1. In chapter 1 we're going to be going over the introduction to anatomy and physiology, going over anatomical terms, etc. This whole lecture and our further lectures are going to be based off the Pearson book of Fundamentals of Anatomy and Physiology by Martini and Neth, the 11th edition. So let's get started. So what is anatomy and physiology? What's the difference? Anatomy is a study of the body's structure, like what is everything, what's this called, the labeling, etc. And physiology is the function of the body. How does it work? How does the blood circulate, etc. So what is anatomy? Anatomy in a little more depth is basically you looking in the mirror and labeling everything. So you look in the mirror, you see your eyes, you see your nose, you point to your ears, what is this? That's all anatomy. It's the same exact thing as if you're dead or alive. So someone's dead, they're going to have the same nose as if they were alive. I like to think of it as basically the study of names. You're studying the blood vessels, you're studying the nerves, the muscles, the bones, um, the joints. You're just studying the names pretty much. On the other hand, physiology is basically what makes your anatomy do things. So for instance, you have bones, you have muscles. What makes them move? How do they move? You have a heart, so that would be the anatomy. The physiology would be, how does it pump? How does the blood go around, etc. So this doesn't function if you're dead. Your anatomy is the same if you're, if you're dead or alive, but your physiology is not functioning if you're dead. So here's just an example of both. For instance, um, on the bottom there's a picture of your liver. That would be the anatomy, that's the actual structure. And what does it do? What's the physiology of it? What's the function? It filters the blood, produces bile, etc. Now you, need, now you need to learn both. You can't just learn one without the other one. You need to know the structure of it, you need to know what it's called, and you need to know what's the function. And it has to be learned together. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the six levels of organization of the human body. So it's basically like steps. We start from the bottom and we keep going up. So the first level is chemical, cellular, tissue, organ, organ system, and organism. In the next slide we'll see what exactly they are. But as you see, it goes from a small little thing, and it comes to an organism, which is you. So as we said, we start off with the chemical level. In the chemical level, we have an atom. An atom is the smallest stable unit that you have to know. It is the smallest stable unit. Molecules are when atoms combine, they form molecules. So you have an atom, and then it combines, it forms a molecule. The shape of of the molecule and the component is going to determine its function. So next we go on to cellular level. A cell is the smallest living unit in the body. They are the basic structural and functional units of an organism. When you have a group of cells, it's called a tissue, which is the third level. So a group of cells that works together to perform a similar function is tissue. For example, connective tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, etc. If you have two or more different types of tissues working together to perform a specific function, it's an organ. For example, the heart wall is made up of cardiac muscle tissue, connective tissue, etc. So that's two or more different types of tissues working together to perform a specific function. The fifth level is organ system. Organ system is a group of organs that interact to perform life functions. For example, the cardiovascular system. It's made up of heart, blood, blood vessels, etc. There's 11 of them, which we'll show you in the next slide. And then goes the last one, which is an organism. Organism is an individual life. All organ systems thus work together to maintain the life or health of organism. So just to recap the six levels of organization of the human body, chemical level, which we have the atom, which is a small stable unit. When atoms combine, they form molecules. The next level is a cellular level. Cell is the smallest living unit in the body. And they are the basic structure and functional units of the organism. When a group of cells combine, we have the third level, which is tissue level. And they combine to perform a specific function, like connective tissue. The next after that, when you have a few different types of tissues working together to perform a function, that's an organ. When you have a group of organs that interact to perform a life function, you have the next level, which is an organ system. For example, the cardiovascular system. You have the heart, the blood, the blood vessels, etc., all combining 
to perform a life function. Then you go on to the last one, which is the organism, which is basically all the organ systems working together to maintain life or the organism. So here are just examples of the organ system. The reason why on the left some of them are bolded and other ones are not is because that's the ones that we're going to be discussing in Anatomy and Physiology 1 versus the other ones are in Anatomy and Physiology 2. So as you see, there's different organ systems. If you look on the right, you'll see the respiratory system. As you, as you see, it's the lungs. Urinary system is showing you the kidneys and the bladders. Your reproductive system, you have your male and female. Tegumentary is the skin. Skeletal is all your bones, muscles. Muscular system is the muscles. The nervous system is the spine and the brain. And the circulatory system is all your blood circulating everywhere. Endocrine system. So basically this just keeps going and it just shows you what all the organ systems are, but we're going to be discussing that a different time, more in depth. Next we go on to anatomical terms. Anatomical terms are very important. Um, if you ever heard in the healthcare setting, that's what they use because instead of just saying his back, it's more precise, it's more uniform, it's more accurate. You'll, you'll be able to understand where exactly they're talking about it as opposed to just a general, you know, my head is hurting now or my stomach's hurting. There's a lot of different organs in the stomach and by you precisely identifying where it is in anatomical terms, it would help to be able to correctly diagnose. If you look at the picture, on the right, so that's what anatomical position is. Unless it's noted otherwise, and they say like this is the position, anatomical position are the hands in, are on the side, the palms are facing forward, and the feet are together. So when you say like front, back, this is where you're talking about anatomical position, and you're saying to the front of that, or to the back of that, or etc. So these are just a bunch of terms that you have to memorize because you're going to have to know this. Interior means below, superior means above. Anterior means the front of your body. It's also called ventral. Posterior means the back of your body. It's also called dorsal. Medial is near the center of the body. Lateral means further away from the center of the body. Distal is further away from the trunk of the body. Proximal is close to the trunk of the body. Here are some more terms, then in the next slide we'll go through some pictures. So superficial means near or close to the surface of the body. Like think about your skin and deep is far from the surface of your body towards the interior of the body so think of like your organs and stuff that you can't see caudal means towards the tail cranial means talking about the head visceral is deep it's not visible till your eye like internal organs palmer means palms palm side of your hand and plantar means the bottom of your foot so here's just some pictures to help you understand. So as you see, anterior, which is also ventral, to the front of your body, posterior, dorsal, to the back. Superior is above, inferior, below. Medial, as you see, it's pointing to the middle of the body as opposed to lateral, is away from the center of the body. And as you see, you could just look at the pictures and see, you know, proximal versus distal, superficial versus deep. Next we go on to body plane. So what is a body plane? So body plane is just helps divide the body into different sections. And why do we have this? It's just to make sure that everyone is on the same page about the exact location. So what is a plane? A plane is a two-dimensional flat surface. Section is a single view or slice along the plane. So as you see, here are th some three common planes. We have the frontal, we have the sagittal and transverse. And as you see in the picture on the right upper corner, is basically how basically it's dividing. So frontal, which is also called coronal plane, is a vertical plane that divides the body into front and back. Sagittal, which is lateral plane, is a vertical that divides the body from left to right, as you see in the picture. And transverse, which is axial plane, is basically dividing the body from top and bottom. And this is great for radiology and imaging, they use this. Okay, so next we go into the body cavities. Our organs inside and everything like that, it's not just like a bag of worms where, you know, you think of your heart, your kidneys, your lungs, just a bag of worms. It's a closed system where the organs are located within cavities. So it's not like it's a bag and everything's kind of like whenever you move, it just goes with you that way whenever you move. It's all enclosed within cavities. The internal organs in these cavities are known as viscera. So everything is basically separated into cavities or spaces, not all mushed together. 
And the reason why this is so that your organs don't shift around. The body cavities include thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic that we're going to be talking about. So here's just a quick chart. As you see, the body cavities, remember your directions. You have dorsal and ventral, and it tells you which one's in which. So now we go through more ways of anatomical terms, etc. So you have your abdominal quadrant. The abdomen is your stomach, as you see in the picture. It could be divided into four different quadrants, which is pretty easy to name. Your right upper quadrant, so as you can imagine, it's in the right upper side. Your left upper quadrant, your right lower quadrant, and your left lower quadrant. Now pain in these areas could signify different stuff because as you see in the picture, you have different organs and different ones. So if someone's talking about pain in the right upper quadrant, it could be talking about a different organ than the pain in the left lower quadrant. So, so that's why it's important to know your region and to know what organ is located in each one. The abdominal quadrants could be further divided into nine different subregions. So as you see in the picture on the right side, it's the quadrants we talk about, the right upper quadrant, left, right lower, and right left lower, and the regions. So you have in the middle, you have your umbilical region, which is basically where the belly button is. You have your epigastric, which is right above it. Hypogastric, which is right below it. So hypo means below. You have your right hypochondriac region, your left. You have your right lumbar region, your left, and your right iliac region, and your left iliac region. So just know all of these. So here's just a picture. As you see, the blue line in the stomach is dividing it into quadrants, so your right upper, right lower, left lower, and right lower. And as you see, the red one is more like a tic-tac, it's your nine subregions. So as you see over there, it's just pointing to different stuff like your spleen, where it's located, your gallbladder, your intestines, your appendix. So for instance, if you, if someone comes in and says, I have right lower quadrant pain. So if you look in the right lower quadrant, one of the stuff that's pointed there is the appendix. So that could mean that they have appendicitis. So that could mean they have appendicitis. So that's why it's important to divide it within these regions so that you understand which organ is where and what it could be. So next we're gonna be talking about homeostasis. Homeostasis, as you see in the picture, is basically a balance. Just think of a seesaw, you want everything straight. Is, so homeostasis is a balance of the internal environment. It is existing of a stable internal environment. Balance is also called the state of equilibrium, everything equal. It is vital for the organism's survival to have homeostasis in the body. Homeostasis is, is regulated by two different mechanisms. So basically, if something's off, it will regulate itself by these two ways. You have autoregulation and extrinsic regulation. Autoregulation is when the activities of cells, tissues, organ, organ systems change automatically. So basically without any neuro or endocrine input when faced with some environmental change. So it's immediate. You don't even realize, you don't even think about it, and it happens right away. For example, someone puts their hand on a stove. They feel pain, the nervous system responds by ordering the muscles to pull away. This even happens without even a second. You put your hand on something hot, you pull it away. You don't even realize it's immediate. It's a, it's a way of homeostasis of your body maintaining homeostasis. Extrins extrinsic regulation results from the activities of the nervous or endocrine system. But it's not immediate. But when it does occur, it persists for days or weeks. So for example, the long-term regulation of blood volume and composition. So here is a method of homeostatic regulation. You have the negative feedback and the positive feedback. The negative feedback is a way of counteracting stuff. For example, if your body likes to be at a temperature of 98.6, it's just um, an average, right? So let's say your body likes to be a temperature of 98.6. If a temperature rides, your body, if a temperature rises, your body is going to respond and try to lower the temperature so that you are at your what it's comfortable with, your homeostasis, your your internal balance. So the way you could do this is by sweating. Negative feedback is the most common type of thing. It's basically a way of counteracting change. There's change in your internal environment and your body wants to go back to how it normally is. It's going to counteract the change or try to. 
Your positive feedback is another way of the body maintaining homeostatic regulation. It basically tries to enhance or increase the original change in conditions. It's not common, and an example of this is blood clotting, labor and delivery, etc. So that is the end of chapter one. We're going to go on to chapter two, and let me know if you have any questions.